Hey, how's everyone doing? Pretty good. So this is not a um, talk on KSLR um, or KASLR. This is a uh, phone system testing the hacker track or hacker tracker app was wrong. So if you're expecting that, I'm sorry. This is we're going to talk about phone systems. So before we get started, mandatory disclaimer: everybody's seen these. Uh, these are my opinions and everything. If you're going to do some of this stuff, make sure you're having your get out jail free card or service trademarks are that of their owners. So yeah, what we're going to talk about is a bit of history, evolution of phone systems, nothing nothing too big or in depth. Um, not going to talk about SS7 carrier side stuff. It's mostly going to be about VoIP and modern phone systems, testing them externally from like the dialing interface. Um, and then we go on how to test those and the issue types you'll find. We're going to map those to the OWASP top 10 as best as we can because we know OWASP is web and we're talking about phone systems so that should be interesting. Um, there's a little bit of overlap between external and internally testing these because of the nature of it but we'd, we'll cover that as best we can and then we'll finish them off with some fun tricks that you can do um, although I discovered you could do so. Um, it's me, Owen Snide is my handle. I've uh, been here since year 2000. Um, I don't have a big list of acronyms behind my name or a title, but um, I'm fairly involved with the local OWASP and 2600. And yeah, I, I like to do presentations, talk to people for fun because it gets me out of my like introvert personality of, um, what do you call it, like that. It gets me out of my comfort zone. <laughs> it makes me pretty nervous talking in front of people. So given a couple other talks on various topics since about 2005, uh, but since 2015, me and Patrick were talking, doing phone system stuff. And it's just a lot to learn and, and do. So that's that. For real fun, I actually ride mountain bikes. It's the longest I've ever ran with one topic, though, is on testing phone systems. So I was born in the 80s, raised in the 90s. Don't know how many of you have seen this before. We had all these antiquated technologies. Uh, but I'm not sure if I miss the 90s, because uh, they weren't that great for me, because this is how you actually had to play video games, if anybody remembers that, is very depressing. When you have to sit next to somebody, there's no real internet. And you, if you had an APT, that's how you had to block them. So you could just take the phone off. You can't do that these days. So. How many people here remember their childhood phone number? Uh, I can't see out the back, but a decent number. So you know, people don't keep their numbers like they used to. Um, times have changed. But the older crowd generally may may remember that. I remember my first phone number, which is really weird because I can't remember other things. Uh, this, this is really good, a really good one if you're into social engineering and stuff to find out, post it on social media and get that secret answer to the secret question. So who uses phones? We do a raise of hands, why not? Nobody, a few. Okay, no, everybody uses phones, right? There's nobody who doesn't in some form. Uh, particularly interested in all of those, but banking, finance could be your daily banking, your retirement, your investments. Those are pretty, pretty scary ones. And then all of these other ones are pretty good too, right? Everybody uses them. So for history on them, really, I'm not going to cover a whole bunch of history. Sorry, wrong number. Uh, me and Patrick did that two years ago. Did a pretty in-depth. Oh, I thought it was in-depth, but a overview of the past, how we got to where we are today. And Exploding the Phone, this book by Phil Lapsley is supposed to be the best book on the phone, kind of a freak history. I have not read it, it's on my bucket list. But we're not going to really talk about that stuff, we're talking about more on the digital side. So, the last slide of the history, or maybe not the last slide, but let's see if you can hear this. Nope. No sound, but we know what the modem sounds like, right? We'll get back to this a bit in the further on in the slides, but at the beginning, this pictogram, you see those, but you can't see it right there. That's kind of important for phone systems. So let's see. I'm going to need sound for some of these future demos, but next slide. This is a history of kind of communication, right? 96 net meeting, all of these, we've kind of been bundling stuff on, everybody's been building technologies to help people communicate. And we got in, what, 10 years ago now, the iPhone rele was released, which is a real game changer. But all of these are closed sourced with the exception of Asterisk because everybody wants to make some money off of, off of communications because you are the product. 
And in more recent history, we have all of these, right? Hangouts and unified communication, screen sharing, Kick, Snapchat, all of these, they kind of related to phone systems because you are communicating, that's the thing. Even Uber and um, what is it, Lyft, they all require a phone number to be activated or to use their service. So that's pretty much all the history that I'm going to cover. And we'll get on to more phone system stuff. So PBX is your, your private branch exchange. This is what is the heart of phone systems because you no longer have to have someone physically plugging stuff in and people, everybody runs them, or not everybody, but a lot of places run them to reduce your costs. You, you get the benefits of all these apps and you know, cheap calling. So that's why people run PBXs and in your basic deployment is gonna be a PBX with maybe a soft phone, a SIP phone, um, or just a ATA, which is your analog telephone adapter. And then the clients in telephony world is called your user agents. Uh, these things, this is more common deployment and you just have more stuff basically. Right, you have a ton more user agents and your unified communications is kind of all tying into each other. And you can see you've got two locations, location A, location B, you can pass calls through them and your provider. So you've got voicemail, all of these things. And then your large deployment looks like that, right? You have redundancy failovers and a whole bunch of other things, which really looks like this. Nobody knows what it looks like, but you have call monitoring, transcribing, all of those. Uh, voice biometrics is interesting and people use it for two-factor authentication and they really use telephone numbers for a whole bunch of things. So your common protocols, as far as VoIP goes, your session, session initiation protocol, um, the example for that is on the right. You, it's very similar to HTTP. You've got a text protocol that you send a request and you get a response. It's very similar. So, and it's to initiate a session, a media session, which would be the RTP stream, which is the real-time protocol. And then you have H323, which is just another kind of a competitor to SIP. And IAX was supposed to kind of be another competitor SIP, which was created by the creator of Asterisk. And that one was supposed to address some pro problems with SIP, but it never really took off as much. And XMPB is another one, the Extensible Messaging and Presence Protocol, that's a mouthful. Um, but they all kind of facilitate phone calls. And then once you've facilitated or orchestrated that call, you have the media, which is transported through a codec. And there's a bunch of these people geek out over these all the time. Uh, but the ones you really have to be concerned about PCM, A law, U law, and then GSM. And uh, U laws for North America, A laws for other countries. And let's see. DTMF is your dual tone multi frequency. So, you know, when you pick up the phone and you dial a number, you hear the beeps, and then you dial extensions, you hear the beeps. It's basically two tones sent at the same time, or two frequencies, and people are pretty familiar with these. These can be easily generated, and that's what happens when you press a button on your phone. So when you, somebody says we want to test our phone systems, the first thing, so you've got to figure out what you're testing, because a phone system could be anything, right? There's, there's a ton of stuff to test, and the first step is to find out what you want to test. So your hardware, software, all the user agents, are PBXs, soft phones, the apps, protocols, codecs, and each of those is going to require their own specialized skill set to get down into the nitty gritty. And it's a, a diverse set of skills is needed. So once you've figured out what you're testing, you've got your black box, white box, you're going to determine the scope. Are you trying to be stealthy? Are you trying to avoid detection or are you trying to test your detection capabilities. Um, what is out of limits? You don't want to go treading on people's, people's feet when you're testing this because it's not the system you thought you were testing because you dialed into something and it turns out you don't own that product. So you can do your information gathering and that consists of what is OSINT, right? You can grab phone numbers from the web, that the company you're testing's website, they generally list a bunch of phone numbers there or you can use corporate directories and look for patterns in the phone numbers because 
you can find them there, um, do port scans. It's noisy on the web if you're looking for like SIP traffic. Um, it's very noisy, so you should kind of throttle that down a bit. And when I say use the web, I mean just Google and use like free carrier lookup tools to see. Um, when I'm talking about looking for patterns, you see a, a, a company will register a block of phone numbers, but they may not publish they may not publish all of them because there's something in there they don't want you to see. Um, who is has information? I was trying to contact Google and I was Googling for the Google's phone number, which is really difficult. But they list it in their who is. If you ever need to call Googleplex, just who is them and you can you can find their phone number. So externally testing through parts, you can sit there with a regular telephone, like any telephone, your cell phone or your landline, and press buttons. Right, that's, that's what we're talking about here is testing. Someone said, I want to test my phone system, and you're you say, okay. Or you could maybe use a modem with AT commands, someone script, or you can script that out a little bit. You can use a soft phone, any of the major ones are going to do that, uh, test functionality. Uh, getting more advanced, you can use the automatable or scriptable ones. These are really interesting, but there's a big learning curve to those. So, I mean, you have to really get into it. Or you can use a just a PBX like asterisk. Um, that's what I chose to do for uh, engagement that we got to do. Uh, I used uh, Orange Pi 2E, if anybody's familiar with those, very similar to a Raspberry, or you could use a VM. But I used it because it has really decent specs. It can handle asterisks really well. It's fairly portable. If you need to show it to somebody, you just take it with you. People like to look at shiny things, right? It turns out. And it doesn't take much to run a demo. So the software used ambient and asterisk, a bunch of scripting utilities. We, we'll get more into this a bit later. So this comes the fun part, or time consuming part of going through the issues you'll find with the OS top 10. So let's take a look. This is the uh, list a lot of you will probably be familiar with the OS top 10 for 2017, which just came out, right? Give you a minute to look over there in case you hadn't seen it yet because everybody's still using the what, version from five years ago. The first one is injection. And we all know the injection points for, for a web app, but for a phone system, you have very similar ones web, voice, SIP, and DTMF, and there's XML injection in there, which I guess falls into a web injection, and the result is. Cross-site scripting, SQL injection, you get buffer overflows or log contamination. Um, there was one with Cisco phones where uh, they were injecting XML or CVE for it, where you inject some XML and you could monitor phone calls or even initiate phone calls from these soft phone, oh, I guess SIP phones, which is kind of scary. Um, so that's, that's injection, we know that, we've, we've seen it before. Broken off and session management is very rampant in uh, phone systems. I mean, it's mostly authentication, but a lot of session management too. You can do call teardown attacks where you're breaking up and just telling to hang up kind of like a Wi-Fi D off attack. Then there's the lack of SSL. Um, I mean, SSL has been, and TLS has been in asterisk since 1.6 version, which was released in 2008. And if SIP is open and controls aren't in place, you can, you know, do your brute forcing of that. That's that's very common. If anybody runs PBX, you'll see that someone trying to hammer your server all day long. All day long, it never stops. And it, if if it does stop and you ban them, they'll come from somewhere else. So. Let's move on to A3 cross-site scripting. And who would have thought that phones would have cross-site scripting, right? It's a telephone. But believe it or not, they have it. This um, screenshot is from uh, the previous presentation I've done, but it's still thing we see a pop-up box. And it's somewhat covered in, from an injection. I mean, it's the outcome of injection is you get a cross-site script. Uh, this could be very interesting with some payloads, or with some custom payloads, or if you're using a company's like portal and you find a cross-site scripting on there, you can maybe use that cross-site scripting to kind of map out some phone stuff. So this uh, demo is from an XSS that was on a system and it's 
use what, what happened is I created a it was unauthenticated XSS and but the same software had a authenticated LFI. So we take a look at the demo. And basically you're using the XSS to facilitate that LFI from an administrator if you were targeting them. So let's take a look. Is it playing yet? Let me press play. All right, so this is the unauthenticated and that's the payload. And I'm sorry for the jerkiness, it's just the way the video record. So that is the payload that is sent. And that's to prove that it's unauthenticated. So we delete the file on the server. There's a shell and this is the authenticated user. All right, so that's the actual payload that you would send to them. And when they move their mouse over the page, what's it doing? Ha! Huh. It just says this is, you, I mean, you'd have to change it if it was running a real attack, but then when you look on the server, there's a, a shell. So, there's the shell, it's been owned. I mean, it's not rocket science, it's a cross-site scripting, but it just happens to be a phone system, so that's why I wanted to show that. Broken access control A4. This is new for 2017, or they moved it around. But the example is not my account. You see that. You have access to, or you access something and it has a string and you change it. Um, Victoria's Secret was very uh, famous for this when they had the, you, you place an order and you change the order number and you could see whatever somebody else had ordered with the full account information. So, I mean, that can be translated for phone systems into a back configuration and this happens when sometimes you dial into a system and then you dial an extension and maybe you can dial an external extension which happens to be a phone number that's externally routed. Maybe you could commit toll fraud with that. So it's related to the next one, which is a security misconfiguration, which is very common, pretty common. Uh, SIP allow guests is you're allowing anybody with a SIP or that wants to connect with a SIP client to connect. And it's difficult to control the context they're in within it. Four digit password for SIP clients, which may happen to be the same as the extensions is pretty common. You want to change that. Don't have your, your, your username the same as the authentication username. There's two separate ones in there for a reason. Now, conferencing misconfigurations, maybe you allow somebody to dial into the conference and then dial out. Default passwords, weak passwords, those, yeah, I consider those misconfigurations. And then misconfigured dial plans and AGIs are probably the most common misconfiguration. An AGI is like the CGI of Asterisk system. So, there is that. Sensitive data exposure. Depends who you talk to, but voicemail and conferencing, pretty sensitive information may get talked about on those. Uh, corporate directories, if you're dialing in, may not, you know, maybe there's some information in there that shouldn't be. Um, we've seen it before. Other, uh, like Mitnick's probably the most famous that exploited that. Um, the, and then the information not used about as well, like the username, password combination, enumeration. It's, this is all I could come up with for the map in this to the OF.10. So it's kind of, once you're on the system, there's a ton of information in there. Um, username, passwords, voicemail passwords, uh, credit card numbers, account numbers, verification. I mean, all of this is once you're on a system is there, but if you're just talking externally testing, maybe there's some sensitive information, maybe not. You have to dig in and find, find it. Missing function level access. You, these kind of overlap together as when you're talking about phone systems. But um, the company or the place I used to work had a system that you would, a, a vendor had this system that they would dial into. And the only access control they had around this was the caller ID. They trusted the caller ID. And you could, if you did your reconnaissance and knew who the vendors were, you could pretty much just dial into this system and you'd have full telnet access with no password because they trusted the caller ID, but everybody knows you can spoof your caller ID. Um, so that was kind of a big fail, but it was very difficult to get them to say, we really need to change this. So 
let's see what else we've got for missing function at level access control. And that, like I was saying, these do overlap. Uh, A5 misconfiguration is very related to missing function level access control. Because if it's configured properly, you would if it's configured properly, you wouldn't have these issues. Um, misconfiguration with if you're putting people back into a different context once they've authenticated, uh, maybe they have access now to something that they didn't have access to before. And reasonable use is boiling down to don't let people sit and camp on your phone lines all day long, going through menus. And maybe if they're five levels deep, you find a combination and it gets you back to the first level. You know, that's an issue. So have session timeouts for trunking because you don't want to let too many people connect and exhaust your trunks, which you have to pay for. Cross-site request forgery is very common for vendor uh, apps and products because not everybody patches those. Um, it's the web portals and configuration pages are very common and often vulnerable. And really from a phone sense, this, this one doesn't really apply, right? There's no CSERF for dialing into phone systems. But if you did your enumeration properly, you would know which products a vendor was using and you'll be able to maybe target that more specifically. And we get into a situation kind of similar to CSERF because all CSERF is is you're exploiting the user's trust in a service. And this is A9, the next one. I did a pivot chart in Excel, which you probably can't really see. Actually, it comes out better on that screen than it does on mine. And it looks like really the best way into a phone system is through code execution overflow, go figure. If you want a good level of access, um, I put as many as I could, vulnerabilities as I could in there, and that's what it came up with. But I'm sure somebody with more Excel foo and more risk experience could probably come up with something really fancy for that. So it's just a little thing I've been working on. Um, but it's, when you're talking about components with known vulnerabilities, you're not talking about just the PBX. You have everything in the stack, right? Your soft phones, all the user agents, and everything in between. So. It's really hard to patch everything. Everybody knows you can't patch everything, but we wish you could. So one of the examples for a known vulnerability is this little box is a Cisco ATA 182. They still sell these on, I mean, what is it, 40, 60 bucks? And that's what translates your analog phone to, a, to be able to use SIP. And in 2002, they had a bug on it, but that's what it looks like if you find one on the web. That's what it looks like when you log in. And if you try and connect with SSL, you, you can't connect. And that's Cisco's uh, end of life announcement for 2010, but these are still used. And the bug actually was you could bypass the authentication completely by sending a few headers with the HTTP request, which is, which is great because you know everybody updates this box that's in on their network, right? Nope. So I'm pretty sure that CSERF would work on that portal too if you really wanted to. So you, you really can't patch everything. And then this is the last one for the OWASP top 10. Underprotected APIs, which is new. The AGI is your gateway interface. Um, that sits internal to the PBX. That really isn't an externally facing API, but it may be underprotected or there may be, not be controls in place for that. And then the ARI is your asterisk RESTful interface. That is often sitting on the web, and I'm sure other vendors have all their own APIs. And WebRTC is coming up more and more. You'll see a lot of these with WebSockets misconfigured. There's a huge, huge uh, attack surface for WebSockets because not everybody, it's not had as much testing. And then user agents being able to be, have their own APIs like the soft phone or in the SIP phone in the picture actually runs JavaScript natively on the phone and has JSON and JS. So I'm sure that API is, Digium, they do a pretty good job of, of securing this. They have a pretty good security team, so I'm sure it's good. This is what I would say the mapping for phone systems would look like. Just reordered it a little bit. Uh, misconfiguration probably being the top one, and then going down those, you can all read those. There's really no evidence or research into this. This is what I think, and I'd love to debate or get people who would like to debate that and kind of do a good list for it because the VoIP Security Alliance is kind of dead at this point. I think they've been dead. 
I know the website went down. Do what? I'm not wrong, thank you. I mean, I was looking at the man, it's been how many years since they've done anything? Then they were doing a good job before, but let's move, let's move on past that. So. Use an asterisk to test. I made a vagrant machine and it's in the GitHub repo. You can do it. You just have to configure a few things, the extensions.conf and the zip.conf. And once you do it, you get a console and then you can configure things like your AGIs. And it's very similar to, you know, a, a router or Metasploit. You, know, you can see the, the great syntax there, core show help, core show help, and that will show you the help on, on the help. It's, it's very easy to use, trust me. <laughs> but no, it's, it's not very easy to use, there's a lot. And the best thing you can do to kind of learn it is, is at the bottom, the command reference, if you want to kind of get into it. Uh, you use any of the soft phones to connect once you have it configured. So this is more of the fun stuff. Um, so for my job, uh, they said they wanted to test the phone systems. So okay, I got actually put on as a secondary to it because one of the other testers had snapped it up from the queue. And they said, okay, what do you want to test? Well, we want to we'll give you the phone number and you can just dial in. <laughs> and you can test it, right? Like, okay. Well, it sounds a lot like QA to me. <laughs> Doesn't really sound like testing. But the other tester, he was using modem and ATM, AT commands and going through, and he actually developed a Twitch because he heard the, the uh, intro, the, the music, too many times. Now, if, if he hears it again, he, he, he winces. But I, I didn't like that. Um, I didn't want to sit there dialing the same thing all day and just hopefully coming across something. So I had this idea from some previous things we've done to kind of do a man in the middle. And I, I didn't have any idea if it would work, but I kind of had a hunch that it would. And so I worked on that and it's nothing new from an attack perspective, but it sure be sitting there and dialing numbers all day. So what happened was we came up with two vectors for it. And we call the first one the fat finger squat, and then the second one's a spoof target bish. And the first one, anybody who's familiar with like crank yankers or pranksters will kind of know this one. And then the spoof target bish is really just an extension of that. So vector A, the fat finger squat. What we have there is this guy. This um, he's, he looks like a pirate with one hand, and it's only a hook. So when he dials who he thought he was dialing, he actually dials the Grim Reaper in this case, who just goes ahead and patches that to the person he thought he was calling based off of, say, I mean, Crank Yank is right. You've heard that, like the lady that dials in trying to get the Honda dealership, but it wasn't a Honda dealership. So in this case, it's a little bit more malicious. Instead of pranking her, they just patch her through and then listen to everything. So. Let's test the audio for this. Um, what I did was I forwarded my home phone number to our corporate line. Let's see. For the demo, I did not use our corporate line because any company would be vulnerable to this because really there's nothing you can do. See if we have any audio. No audio. I've got my volume at max, it's plugged in. I, we could do that, we could unplug it and use the mic, we could try. Since, since we kind of have to do something because this very much relies on sound. Bloop. Now I'm not, now I don't have any sound. This is great, it won't let me do anything. Let me plug it back in. What a demo fail. And it wasn't even a hard demo. Let's see now if we have sound. Oh, the audio guy's coming. That's all right, we've got some time. There's not much left to cover, so. What's going on with this? It's plugged in. Doesn't sound hot there. Nothing. <laughs> it's 
stuff just goes crazy. And now the signal's gone. Don't you love it when things go so smoothly? Have I tried turning it off and on again? <laughs> yeah, okay, that's the HDMI. Nope. That's the best. The best sound ever. I just plugged in HDMI. Yeah. No, I just unplugged the HDMI because I lost uh, audio. Oh, it lost everything from that. It's coming back up now, so let's take a look. Sorry, guys. They told me to do it for a quarter inch jack, so. This is weird. Is so, it logged in? Nope. It's frozen now. Oh, <laughs> what? It's great. Uh, you want to reboot? Let's get this thing going. Yeah. Normally, it just. Somebody put a magnet under here. <laughs> right. Classic Def Con tradition. She's frozen. It's, right it's, it's busted now. <laughs> yeah, it was set to the quarter. So, right. We'll give it a, if you can be patient and go a minute. It was stuck on the other one and when I tried to do it. Yeah, yeah we'll change the audio out. And get it working. And when it boots, uh, <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll give it a shot. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> well, it's your first time speaking. I mean, this has to happen. One and a half, I guess. Oh, one and a half. Okay. <laughs> All right. Not that big of a deal, right? There we go. Um, you want to jump into system preferences and get the speaker up here, and then we can choose the output device. Show volume and bar. Okay. So now um, we can just do an internal speakers yeah. and use the mic. Is this That's fine. Up? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's give that a shot. All right. Sorry about that. Now I have to switch the monitors again. Right there. It's all right. Let's, let's use the mic. How are we doing on time now? I lost it. All right. So again, this is the the demo for it. So I had to call the New York Public Library because I didn't know who else to call. It wouldn't get me in trouble. So let's see. And that's not working either. All right, that's great. All right. We will skip the recorded demo. <laughs> and you can trust me that it works. So I have a recording of it. So I'll put that in the GitHub too. So the spoof target Vish is pretty much the same thing, but it was an add-on for it because basically what you have now is the attacker is taking, taking it into their own hands and calling the guy with one hand. And maybe he has a context, maybe he doesn't. Maybe he saw him complaining on Twitter how his service wasn't working, so the attacker then goes, hey, I'm going to call this guy and kind of calm him down. And then I'll, I'll patch him into the real the real place. So if the demo had worked, what you'd left, be left with is a recording which would contain, what would that contain? Maybe DTMF tones or maybe voice authentication. That would be relevant to someone you might have an interest in. And yeah, you would, if you got DTMF tones in there, you can potentially decode those. It's, pretty difficult to decode them, to be honest, because of codecs. It can be done, and it could possibly be done better with like a hardware decoder or maybe an ATA, or if somebody with more skills comes in and actually writes something that when it's intercepted the call, it fully disconnects it from the other side. <laughs> but that would be a, a, 
problem, right? If you're entering account numbers, you can see that. But what happens a lot of times is when you type a number in, it will repeat it back to you. If you're not using an IVR same when they say, please enter your account number, you say one, two, three, four, five. If, you know, it says you entered one, two, three, four, five, is this correct? You know, that's kind of a problem. So let's see if uh, this one works because that one works. That was account number one, two, zero, right? So yeah, if you can't decode the DTMF, Sometimes it just plays it back to you, which is, I mean, maybe a problem for you, maybe it's not. But FreakMe is a project we've been working on. It's all on GitHub. Uh, uh, we, we're messing around with voicemail stuff uh, and spoofing caller ID saying, hey, if you got a phone, num a phone call from your voicemail, would you answer it? Would you enter your PIN? So that's kind of what this was spawned out of. And I put an RTFM on there because there's a, if anybody's seen the red team field manual, there is nothing in there about voice. So I've, I've started compiling tools and things you can use to test phone systems in there. And I've done as much as I can in there. And there's more changes to come to, to it. I've got some ideas and things to do. Which other demo? This one? Yeah, there's not a whole lot to it. I can try. Thank you for calling Ask NYPL. Our normal hours of operation are Monday through Saturday from 9 to 6. You can email your reference question or chat with a reference line. For the hours and locations of the Schwarzman building, please press 1. For the science, industry, and business library. So that was what happened when you call my home phone number. Now I just forward it through to NYPL and record it. So not much for a demo, but it's something. And, and coming from, hey, here's your phone. Here's a phone number. Can you test it? That was a kind of a cool thing to to do. So, some additional things you can look at if you're interested in VoIP security or voice security is this book by Singress Publishing. It was published, I think, in about 2005. But it's a really good book. It has a ton of information. I think it's about 800 pages. And Fatty. He does the VoIP wars. He's done a bunch of stuff here at DEF CON and all around the world. He's done a lot of really good stuff. Anything from him is pretty much awesome. And Jason Ostrom did VoIP hopping the hotel. If you want to look at that, is where you have a phone system. You can hop VLANs. That was really good. And then just for reference, there's the VoIP uh, at the bottom of there. So that's about all I have. Um, I, I'd really like to see more people get interested in phone systems again because, you know, you had 2,600 in the Freaks um, and there's Telefreak too, but it, it doesn't seem like a whole bunch of people are testing their phone systems. So that's really what I was getting at with this. I mean, I play with them for fun and I submitted this talk and you guys accepted it. So, yeah, I mean, things have been evolving at a rapid rate, but have we been testing them? I don't know. So hopefully it was useful, gave you guys some insight, uh, some things you could do and may get you interested. And if you have any ideas or things you, could, you want to suggest, then you can catch me afterwards. I'll be down there, catch me on Twitter. The slides are all on GitHub, like I said. So that's it. Thank you very much.